for any any listener out there who is is of the mindset that hygiene is just what it is. It's just a loss leader. I'm never going to make any money there, but it's it helps me get to where I need to be restoratively. Um, we hope that you'll open your mind um, and uh, be, be open to new ideas that it doesn't have to be that way. This is Growth in Dentistry, a dental intelligence podcast where we ask the question, what does growth in dentistry look like to you? I'm Katie Polson, a dental hygienist and your host. Welcome to Growth in Dentistry, a dental intelligence podcast. I'm Katie Polson, and we are just, you guys, I say this every time, but for real, I'm really excited about this episode. So uh, we've got Mary Hughes and Stephanie Palmer from Dental Education Partners. And when I got on the, my pre-interview call with them, like I do all the time, I was like, hey, this is such, you know, super fun, super fun ladies. But honestly, we talked forever. We talked forever. And then, and then I was like, well, we should probably make this into a two-parter. So if we get to 60 minutes, this is going to be split in half and you're going to love it. I promise. So, but before we get going on that, if this is your first time listening to the show, welcome, but welcome, welcome. Um, we've got lots of other content for you to go check out. We've got some deep dive episodes with some of our top performing practices. We go into their analytics and their, or their numbers and figure out how they got to where they are. Those are super interesting episodes. We've got uh, some episodes with some key opinion leaders, uh, just like we're doing today. And then also some episodes for DSOs. So something for everyone. If you are back for and listening for more, thank you to my family for joining again. Just kidding. But for real, please go and rate and review this podcast. It helps so much. Uh, and if you are a fan of Facebook, if you'd like to hang out there, we'd love for you to join us in our dental intelligence community. We've got lots of good conversation going on in there. And last but not least, if you aren't a current customer of dental intelligence and you would like to be one or see how it can uh, affect your practice, you can go to get.dentalintel.com forward slash podcast and listeners to our show will get $50 when they complete a demo. That's it. That's all that we have to do in the intro because I don't want to waste any more time. Mary and Stephanie, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for joining us. Thanks, Thanks joining, you. joining me. I say us, but it's just me. It's just you. <laughs> thank, th thank you for having us both. I think, you know, um, Mary's usually the, the face of our company. So it's such a pleasure to be invited to, to, <laughs> to join along on this. Well, journey. you both yeah. have beautiful faces to be the face of the company. Thank so thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Well, tell us, a little, tell us a little bit about yourselves individually, Mary and then Stephanie. Um, tell me about how you got into dentistry and and then we'll have you talk about dental and education partners. Well, excellent. Well, I know for me, I actually got into dentistry literally right out of high school. So I got a job as a dental assistant with my family dentist who was like, come on, I'll show you how to do it and that sort of thing. So I got a job as an assistant and assisted him. And then I moved into a treatment coordinator position and eventually his office manager but what I found is I was really good at patient care and I really liked that caring for people on a one-to-one -one basis. And so once I recognized that, I went to the college and I enrolled in dental hygiene and I went to school and became a dental hygienist. And what was interesting in that is because I had worked in the business part of dentistry as well as the clinical, it gave me a very unique perspective as far as how important, yes, of course, comprehensive care is recognizing and treating disease, but then also too, how to combine that with proper coding and billing so that there is an actual trail of the patient's progress and the patient's outcome. So I think together, it really helped me in my career. And what's interesting is it's been a long career. I think it's been like 117 years or something like that. <laughs> But it's been a really long time. And throughout that, I, I have moved in different circles in dentistry, always staying within dentistry, whether it was from a manufacturing and sales part of dentistry with offices and training sales teams, as well as training dental teams. It was it's really sort of been a unique ride. And now, of course, with the venture of dental education partners for the last eight years, anyway, mm -hmm. of doing that and working with offices across North America, the United yeah. States. Awesome. I love that you brought that up and we'll maybe get into it a little bit later, but I feel like as a hygienist, it really is important for you to understand the business aspect of dentistry oh. um, because I don't think you appreciate, especially if you're working for a small business practice, you cannot understand um, the level of worry and stress that goes into owning a practice if you don't sure. really understand the back end of it. Um, and it will give you a lot of, like, I think 
a level of empathy and better communication with your doctor if you do make an effort into making yeah make, they don't understanding teach that in school no no they, they, they barely teach well, two teach, two or three yeah. codes they were two, like they okay, teach they teach coding at like the last like six months good luck you there know you go. there's three of them you got plenty, <laughs> yeah. plenty of codes. that's all you need okay <laughs> yeah, no. they'll know what to do at the desk they'll know what to do yeah <laughs> So true. Oh my gosh. Okay. All right, Stephanie, tell me a little bit about you and how you landed here. Uh, absolutely. Yes. So my background is is quite different. Um, <laughs> although I did end up on um, working clinically as a dental assistant for a little while, really where my passion is, is on the business side of things. I, uh, I've been in dentistry for over a decade, but I actually came in a, a, a kind of a a meandering way into the field of dentistry and there's no going back for me but I started in corporate events and so I came into dentistry leading uh, a, a team um, a, a, as a director of events for a, a company and we had hundreds of CE events all throughout the year um, trade shows all of that thing and so I met dentists all across um, United States and Canada met them really, really, really the, the, the bug bit me, so to speak. And I, it, there was no going back. And then Mary was actually one of our key opinion leaders. She was one of our hygiene speakers. And that's really where we first met. And she actually brought me to um, one of the offices and I had to observe a, a live implant for the first time. And, and typically she found that the people she brought in um, to observe this would like pass out or yes. get ill uh -huh. or whatever. But I was so fascinated. I, I just thought it was the, the best experience ever. And from there, I was like, I need to understand this clinical side of the business so much better. It will help me be more rounded. It will help me help deliver better training and continuing education events. And, and from there, the rest was history, so to speak. So awesome. I'm... I'm very passionate about this industry. I think that it it brings, obviously, ultimately, we're focused on patient care. I think Mary emphasized that in, in the importance um, of um, hygiene and, and dentistry in, gen in general to the overall health of a person. But it provides so many unique and interesting career opportunities. I mean, look at you mm -hmm. um, as a hygienist leading these podcasts, which are awesome, by the way. Um, I, we've been listening to so many of them, really learning a lot from you and the other yeah. players. So it's awesome that Dental um, Intelligence is offering this service to people. Um, but it's offered these amazing career opportunities, um, whether you want to work in an office with, on patients or on the business side of things, really, which has ended up being more my preference, um, doing the analytics side of things, um, going out to trade shows, so many avenues in this industry and it's fascinating and, and at the end of the day it's all about good so that's one of the things I love about it and if you're doing it well you can also make money which is why I think there's been this transformation in dentistry um, with DSOs and venture capital firm and coming in and really saying wow there is a lot of money to be had here so mm -hmm. that's my background in a roundabout way um, and how I landed here awesome it sounds like you guys are just like a perfect little, uh, team as far as like what you guys both can bring to the table. Yeah, so great. that's awesome. Yeah. So, yeah. So cool. yeah. Most um, days. Yeah, most, are. most, <laughs> well, I mean, that's life. So, um, tell us a little bit about dental education partners and what makes it different from some of the other consulting firms out there. You know, it, dental education partners, actually, we, we actually founded it together, understanding after working with dental practices that it was the same hiccups in, pro in, in processes, in systems that they were lacking. And a lot of times there was no visibility to a lot of things. And so we recognized, you know, all of these things are important. And clinically, we're all very good. We learn a lot of things in school, dentists, very good clinically, some of the best surgeons in the world, hygienists, very good clinically. But when you put it all together, there's a lot of gaps. And so we decided that we would take those areas of gaps and we would turn it into a continuing education platform that actually customizes training for offices. Not every office needs the same thing. Mm -hmm. You know, in some of your podcasts, you have these really, really amazingly successful offices. 
And a lot of other offices think, well, how come they're doing it and we struggle, right? So what we did was we actually put together some of the things that we were seeing on a repeated basis and put together a course content curriculum where we could use that platform to actually talk about the procedures and services, provide continuing education, obviously, for license renewal. But then we could also work at the executive level with the doctors, understanding analytics and metrics and what's actually happening and actually diagnose what's happening with the business. And so we do partner with specialists, doctors, and people who are great in leadership. Maybe they're, maybe they're not from dentistry, but they're excellent in leadership or revenue cycle management or AR and collections, people who are very good with communication skills and, you know, verbiage with patients and patient presentation. And so we partner with a lot of different people and we were, we thought, well, we'll put it all together as dental education partners, and then we will help practices really find their rhythm and their stride. And I think we've been really successful in doing that with a lot of practices and being able to bring them to the potential and really sort of demystify dentistry in the private practice. Yeah, right. I think that our metrics-based approach is truly, truly um, the foundation mm -hmm. of our success in Absolutely. helping practices be successful. Mm -hmm. And it's it helps us, like most dentists, um, they know how to achieve growth. They know how to get there. But um, there, it's hard to work on the business while they're working in the business. It's hard to grow a hygiene department if you're in, you know, doing a crown prep. So, so we bring this metrics-based approach. We help them understand all aspects of their business, both you know, clinically, operationally, financially, through the metrics, and help develop a path with them based on what they're trying to achieve. Mm -hmm. Right. So, you know, some of the some of the um, dentists are trying to exit dentistry. They've been doing it for a long time. Some are just getting started and want to grow up. Some want to expand. Um, some want to buy multiple offices. So uh, like Mary said, each one is different. Um, some have four ops, five ops. Um, it's different for them versus the ones that say with 12 ops and you have four hygienists. So I think how we can go about that is first understanding what they're trying to do, what their goals and objectives are personally and professionally, where do they want to grow? And then we figure out that roadmap based on the metrics. Right. Sort of meeting, yeah, meeting them in their journey. I think wherever yeah. they are in their journey, meeting them there and then helping them to fulfill what it is, where they're going next, whatever that is. But yeah. 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 And we do, I think we, we've tended because, uh, you know, Mary's been a key opinion leader in hygiene for so long, and that's really her passion. It's now my passion too. <laughs> I think we've, we've tended to really, our, our niche really is um, helping offices that want to be doctor led, but hygiene driven. Mm. Yeah. And we'll get into that in a little bit. I, uh, that, that, that I think specifically sets you apart very much so, cause there's a lot mm -hmm. of practice, a lot of, uh, consulting firms and, and not that, I mean, they all have their own different, different ways of doing things, but, um, the hygiene department sometimes definitely can feel like a loss leader. So we'll talk yeah. about that in a minute, but I wanted to just like address the fact that I think what, what really sticks out to me is what, what you guys are doing is, I mean, we call it change management. It's really hard to get people to ch change what they're doing, especially, I don't know if it's human nature or if in dentistry, it's just really hard. <laughs> like, why are we so like adverse to learning something new? I don't know what it is, but like we get our, like, we get our routine we get the things that we do. And even if it takes us 10 times longer than it would adopting something new, we just like avoid at all costs. So <laughs> it's very true. I, yeah. I really sort of, I hit the nail on the head. Absolutely. I mean, I have to say. <laughs> and what's interesting is dentistry has really sort of, it's based on evolution. It's like tribal knowledge. It's not written anywhere <laughs> in the office. <laughs> don't know why we do it that way. We just do it that way. And so when you come into a new practice, you're like, oh, well, why do you do it that way? And everyone looks at you as like, what? Well, yes. Because that's when we've always done it. And you're mm -hmm. like, oh, Oh, okay. And we just accept that as truth and we move forward. So what you find is most systems in the dental practice are by evolution. No, Nobody I don't started. doubt it. We just do it that way. That's yeah. how we roll. Right. So when your front desk comes in and they have to learn all on their own, how to use the new practice management software or how to new, some of these new technologies that are coming out, mm -hmm. they're going to learn it their way. And like I said, 
if you're the dentist and you're in the back, you can't be there to train them necessarily on the way that's right. the most efficient or the way that um, is, is the best use of it, of the technology or whatever system that is. And so they, they learn that on their own. It becomes a tribal knowledge. It's not written down. And when you do try to share with them a way that maybe perhaps would save them time, would help them be more effective at their job, um, would help them help the practice be more profitable. Um, so many things it, it, it is, you, you're absolutely right. It is change management. And uh, that is absolutely a very challenging thing, which is why all of our, our training and, and CE is customized based on um, what we're seeing in the numbers, based on what the doctor's seeing, and then getting to know the teams and their their strengths and their opportunities mm -hmm. for growth. And that that is, it's challenging. Yeah. Um, it can take some time. Certainly. Yeah. I just, I love that it's, it's customized, right? I mean, it does every practice it, like you said, is tribal. I mean, you know, one practice is the same. It's no. weird. It's scary that way. I mean, like, that's why I never tempt guys. Those of you that have temp, God bless you because I, I don't, I, the, the thought of going into like a blind a practice, I've never known. And just like work. I'm like, I, I mean, like, I, I don't even know if I had on a scale anymore. <laughs> like you're like, well, I know how to do that part. Can you just tell me equipment's right. all different? All of it. All of where it. everything is. Yeah. yeah Sterilization. So it's so yeah. wild. Oh, right. Well, so let's get into the hygiene department, which is why I think and then why I think this this show could go for a while. Um, but <laughs> mainly because and we haven't talked about dental hygiene for a long time and, and running a hygiene practice on the show for a long time. So I definitely think it's overdue. Um, I wish that this was coming out like, you know, during like dental hygiene month or something. This but... is a call right now. Yeah, yeah. it's not right. Yeah. yeah. But I was going to say every month is dental hygiene awareness month. I but... know that should be right. We should, yeah. Yes. We should get gifts. <laughs> parades. Oh my gosh. Um, <laughs> parades. <laughs> Oh, I'm the dentist listening. You're like, they don't need another reason to be in the <laughs> Sit down. <laughs> oh my gosh. Well, so let's discuss, like, let's get into first, like, what do you, what do you, what do you say to people that are like, Hey, like hygiene is a loss leader. Like I've heard it myself. I think I've even said it myself, you know, like I, I definitely feel like my job is in, in, as a hygienist is not, we're not going to make money by me scaling teeth. Is how I felt like there's some consultants and marketing companies who have believed that's, their that's the strategy for growth. Mm -hmm. that, yeah. That's sadly. Yeah. Which is, you know, it's interesting. That's such an interesting uh, statement. Loss leader. I actually, up until I had heard it all throughout my career, but I never really knew what it actually meant. And so probably about two or three years ago, I actually researched it to see what it actually meant, what loss leader actually meant. And as it turns out, the true definition of it is, is when a, co a company or an organization gives away free trials or they give away free stuff in order to bring in new clients or new customers. Well, when I read that, I was floored. And I thought, so hygiene is viewed as the giveaway of the practice similar mm -hmm. to the free toothbrush or similar to a whitening or that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. And that has not been my experience. And, and to me, I was, I was sort of shocked at that because number one, um, really successful practices, ones that we work with, ones that we partner with, ones that we know, key opinion leaders that we listen to speak, a truly successful dental practice understands that the hygiene department is actually the annuity of the dental office. And so the key takeaway is understanding that not only should it be profitable, it literally is the business within the business. Because hygiene, patients might not do veneers, patients might not, especially if there's, you know, economical issues or whatever it is, they might not do those things. They might put those off elective dentistry, they might put off, but patients will come in for their hygiene visit. Mm -hmm. And so I think it really is kind of com combining that to understand fully, this actually is something that is the engine that makes the machine go. And so when I talk to offices and doctors, I'll say, so, you know, they do have their own philosophies on how to grow a dental practice. And for many of my very dear doctors that I worked for, they were like, I know, I'll just work more, or I'll see more patients, or I'll do more procedures. And, and finally, I would just say, you know, and then what do we do if anything 
God forbid happens to you, then what do we do? Please let us as your providers pick up a corner because many hands make light work. This isn't all on you. And we are providers that actually have a license to post and bill the same as an associate doctor. And so the difference is, is that we don't always have a clear expectation or a roadmap of what the doctor wants from us, mm -hmm. but we know how we would like to actually practice and perform. We just don't ever feel like we can say to the doctor, hey, can we sit down and talk before I take this job, before I get started, or even once I'm hired, can we talk about what the philosophy of care is and what your philosophy and value on the dental practice, on the dental hygiene side of it is? How do you see it? Do you see it as a necessary evil, which is sometimes what it's called, or do you see it as something that can actually create good, solid foundational relationships with the patients and we can treat a patient holistically from your side of the house and my side of the house together? So it's really important that we empower teams to do that, is to really fully understand what the hygiene visit and the hygiene schedule and the hygiene department actually means to a practice. So no. loss leader, once I realized that I was like, oh, what a terrible marketing term. That's horrible <laughs> because it's not really what it is. It's not. And we can't see ourselves that way either. So sometimes it's breaking down those barriers and breaking down those, you know, sort of misnomers and, and really seeing within ourselves truly the provider that we were the day we walked across the stage. Yeah. We, we've we even worked with um, Medicaid practices, right, where their reimbursements are next to nothing in hygiene. And there still is money to be made in those offices and mm -hmm. hygiene. Very much so. And so I think for any any listener out there who is is of the mindset that hygiene is just what it is, it's just a loss leader. I'm never going to make any money there, but it's it helps me get to where I need to be restoratively. Um, we hope that you'll open your mind. Um, and uh, be, be open to new ideas that it doesn't have to be that way. Right. That's true. Yeah. Let's get into some of those ideas, I guess, uh, because when I think about, and I've talked to, I have a course that I've taught about on this, uh, on being an irreplaceable hygienist, but like what that means and like the communication between a dentist and a hygienist is something that really, um, fascinates me or like a provider and a mid-level provider. And I've studied it across all medicine. Like it, it, the, the, the problems that exist in dentistry are not just in dentistry. They exist in anesthesiology and in a doctor, you know, with a PA, like they all, they're all kind of the same. So what would, what would you suggest a hygienist or a doctor do? How, how do they start a conversation like that of getting on the same page to make sure that the hygiene department is successful and profitable? I think for me personally, I think for me, it's really understanding, having a clear understanding of the expectations. Yes, you're right. It happens all across healthcare. There's a pecking order, if you will, or a hierarchy, which there's nothing wrong with that. But one of the, the things that we talk a lot about is, is is leadership and leadership is not a role and it's not a title it's an action really and so it's it's looking at the practice and also talking with the providers and saying you know one of the questions that i'll usually ask is tell me about your handoff your patient handoff mm -hmm. and they're like well i i do this with this doctor and i do that with this doctor and i'm like that's awesome I, I, and i missed part of it can you just show me where that's written down if i were going to temp here or i were starting here how would i know that and they're like, oh, don't worry, you get to know it. You kind of get to, know that's what I'm talking about, evolution. Mm -hmm. And then I'll talk to the doctor separately and I'll say, is that the way that you, you, you prefer it done that way, the handoff done that way? And they'll say, no, actually, nobody, actually, no one ever asked me how mm -hmm. I wanted the patient handed off to me. That's really a great question. We, re we should really sit down and put a pen to paper and, and really document how do we want this done? Some doctors that I work with, as a hygienist, they want me to have PAs of all root canal teeth because they want to check the integrity of the apices of the tooth. Then there are other doctors that don't need me to do that. Some dentists that I work with, they want me to take an intraoral photo of every three surface filling and larger so that they can check the margins on the screen. Some doctors don't need me to do that. And it's really sort of, but how would I know unless I coming into the practice took it upon myself to say, hey, doctor, how would you like me to hand off the patient to you? Would you like me to introduce you to the patient as you're walking in? Or do you want to do that yourself? Do you want me to sort of say, you remember, this is Tom. Tom came in, he's new to us about six months ago. Do you want me to refresh your knowledge? Or do you just want to look at the record and, and walk in and 
not have me not do that. Right. So I think it's very simple. It's really about expectations, setting expectations, being clear on them, and then also revisiting those. Are they working? Do they work? We can change those at any time. We can modify, we can revise, we can polish if it's not suitable, if it's not working. So I think it's one of those things where we never really talk about the expectation part of it. I know in every job that I started, it may be true for you too, is that when we started, it was sort of like, that's where you put your coat, you keep your purse there, that's the break room, that's sterilization. Um, I'm Jennifer and your patient's here. That's mm -hmm. our training and onboarding. And that's kind of all we get. Oh, and, and your instruments are there. And it's, <laughs> and it's sometimes one and done. So I, I mm -hmm. think one of the things is you actually, and this is very hard, but you actually have to set time aside to do mm -hmm. this. And it's not just one time, but it, it, I mean, if you're a dentist and you're, and you're like, yeah, I, 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 I rarely talk to my hygienist or a hygienist. You're like, I, I can, I can barely even get them to come in or her to come in for the exam. It's like, okay, so we need to get a framework around when can we have this dialogue with each other where we can get on the same page, mm -hmm. um, where we can understand what the expectations are, where the where the dentist can um, actually have trust mm -hmm. in their hygienist um, for everything that they're knowledgeable on, they're trained on, they know mm -hmm. how to do, and their skill set they bring and what they can bring to the practice mm -hmm. to have that trust that they're going to do this for them. Um, and, and we don't have that friction that we so often find. I think that you have to have a framework um, where you set aside time, um, structure your, your meetings, mm -hmm. um, where it's not free form. It's not something, a, a lot of dentists are drivers, right? That, that if you do a disc profile, they're, they're that D and, and they just want to get, get, get to it, right? Go, 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 go. And, and this is something where you have to give it time. Now you can set up a framework, maybe if that's your office or your speed and all that, where your meetings can be 10 minutes of time or, mm -hmm. or, or, or short snippets like that, where you go along, but you have to dedicate that. And, um, and we can also, we have helped bridge that gap mm -hmm. between dentists and hygienists. Um, yeah. Sometimes it's needed. Sometimes you need some me a mediator to like, <laughs> it's like a marriage. <laughs> yeah. It really is like a marriage Come in and be like, okay, Okay. Uh, you guys so are not speaking the same language. Like exactly. And we do actually encourage a lot of our clients to do those clin at least, you know, quarterly clinical conversations. Yes. They don't have to go all afternoon or anything else mm -hmm. like that. We give a format and a structure and they can either use it or, or do a take on it, that kind of thing of mm -hmm. how do we actually have those conversations in a very productive way in a, in a, in a very patient centric way so that we're not just, and, and I get it. Like a lot of times doctors will be, you know, they feel like it's a lot of drama and not data. They mm -hmm. feel like it's a lot of just brought to the table of, well, they're just going to unload all of these problems on me and I'm exhausted. And I really don't have the bandwidth to hear this one yeah. more thing. So I think we structure it as it has to be data driven. You have to show proof of what you're talking about. So in this patient instance, this happened. Can you help me understand why you recommended this instead of this, just so yeah. that I'm aware of, of how you maybe see clinical procedures and that kind of thing. I love that. So writing it down, writing down your, what we call an SOP, your, yeah. your, yes. your, right. Your go right down your handoff. I, I love, I love that. And it doesn't um, have to be a binder. No. Right? Yeah. Just, <laughs> yeah. We don't need to make a, a, and put and scrapbook it. Just, just write it down. No, but that's kind of a neat idea with pictures. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Um, or I'm, um, well, I'm a huge fan of media. So like videoing your hand yeah. off would be yeah. really cool. Um, yeah. mm -hmm. um, and then also taking the time to set a time to, to do, do those conversations. I would love that you said that because clinical, uh, clinical, what did you call them? Clinical conversations. Clinical conversations yeah. They, um, so I worked with my brother and my dad. Uh, who my dad, who had passed away, but like my brother, oftentimes my, my family would often think my, my sister, she'd be like, you get to see him all the time. I'm like, we literally do not talk like the communication that we have, like when we're at the office. And if you think about this, really like it, as you're thinking about the conversations and the communication that you have, there's quality and there's quantity, right. Mm -hmm. And all you're probably having with your staff is a lot of quantity, um, and not a lot of quality. And so, yeah, like I would see my brother all the time. Like, I have no idea how he's doing. We would get together like uh, at the end of the week on a Sunday for our, like our family dinner. And like, I would learn all these new things. And I'm like, I was with you earlier this week. I did not know any of that. 
turns out you're, you know, you're having whatever else problem going on. And I'm like, good. That would have been awesome to know on Monday when I saw you. So <laughs> like, I think that, that happens all the time. And that's just seeing that was, one example of a family. Yes, if, you, if you're right. not family with the people that you work with, then like you won't ever get that. You never right. get that quality. Right. Exactly. Right. So important. I'm glad you brought that up. It's so important. And, and having a framework around how the dialogue goes in that clinical conversation and mm -hmm. some ground rules around yes. the conversation yes. of when we go astray, somebody raises the stop sign and says, oh, we're veering off right. the yeah. purpose of this. We're, I want to move into those KPIs and we'll kind of come back to leadership, which is a, a question I want to talk about, but mm -hmm. because we talked about emotion. Uh, one of the things that I've talked about before is, uh, the, <laughs> I don't know if den most, if everyone is just conflict avoiding uh, or if just dentistry just really just brings all of the people who do not like conflict over, they're all conflict diverse into one pool and then they all work together. But, um, but definitely one of the reasons I would imagine these one-on-one -on -one meetings or these, mm -hmm. you know, clinical conversations, like you said, are because of emotions and they, it's really easy to get into a, a it's, it's like setting, like setting yourself up to be in a conflict situation. Yeah. So I love that you are having a framework mm -hmm. and talking about numbers and data. So let's get into what you measure and why it's important. Is that cool? Yeah. yeah so absolutely. let's okay. do it. All right. All right. Well, um, we, we predominantly use dental intelligence as our source. If, if we work with a, a client and they don't have it, we absolutely encourage them to get signed on board right away because there is every single data point that you could ever want available, which we do look at them all. But relative to driving hygiene, we look at some of the top level ones. Obviously on the, the, the clinical side, we're looking at periodiagnosis right? Um, that, that That's so important. Um, without that diagnosis, we're never going to get the treatment. Um, it also helps us identify, is the doctor and the hygienist on the same page mm -hmm. uh, looking at that, that diagnosis rate? Um, so so in, in, if you have multiple hygienists, are they on different levels? Mm -hmm. So do you have a, a practice and maybe the patients are seeing different hygienists and, and one's really and good and, and not good. Um, and so we, we encounter that a whole lot. So we take a look at that, that diagnosis, then of course, from their treatment, um, and also prevention. Mm -hmm. Um, and so there's some fantastic metrics there relative to fluoride treatment. That's obviously, um, one of the, the, the key, um, things that a hygienist can do, uh, to help obviously prevent, um, future issues, but also it can be a, a practice, driver and it can provide comfort to the patient. So a number of things um, mm -hmm. on the financial side, we, we obviously look at total production. Um, we really like the metric of, of production per hour. Um, we'll look at the production per visit, but it's, it's very interesting where we were just actually um, talking to a new prospective client and we saw their hygiene production per visit was like over, you know, $350. We're like, man, they're doing great. They're doing fantastic. What are we possibly going to be able to do to help? So we had to dig a little bit deeper because we know just about every office has an opportunity to improve. And when you, when you start diving deeper, then you see, oh, wait a minute. Well, their visits, they say their schedule's full, but mm -hmm. at the end of the day, there are cancellations and no shows and they're, they're seeing, about four patients a day on average. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, they're doing, they're doing pretty good on their perio services. They're, they're doing prevention and they're doing um, adjunctive hygiene services. And so that's what's driven up their production per patient visit. But as a whole, there's so much more opportunity there because their visits aren't there. They're, um, they're having issues operationally mm -hmm. um, with the front desk and staying scheduled. Uh, and so, I think that we we like to go in and do a baseline of everything. Mm. See where we're at, discover what the goals are, and then narrow down into um, what are the growth opportunities with that office. And then we work side by side with the dentist, the hygienist. Mm -hmm. um, Mary has these these one-on-one uh, -on -one conversations with hygienists about professional development, mm -hmm. um, introducing them to metrics. So many of them 
uh, um, this is new to them. That was part one of this episode. Make sure to catch part two next week. You don't want to miss it. Uh, if you are already really intrigued about what dental intel- edu- dental ed- education partners can do for you, you can go to their website at dentaleducationpartners.com and see more about what they can do for you and your practice. Again, part one's done. Join us for part, part two next week. Uh, and it's so great. This has been Growth in Dentistry and Dental, a dental Intelligence Podcast. I'm Katie Polson. Keep growing.